good uh, like i said uh, greetings to colleagues from bangkok um, welcome everybody um, to the launch of the regional stem study uh, as well as the UNDP, RBAP, and RBAC STEM for All platform collaboration that we are launching today. Um, we have, uh, as we have shared our agenda uh, with the invite, uh, we will also be having very interesting panel discussion. Uh, we'll also be sharing some of the findings from the STEM study and also uh, request uh, the colleagues here who have joined us to uh, you know, start actively participating in the STEM for All platform after this uh, inaugural. Uh, so without much ado, I, uh, we, I think we can begin. I will hand over uh, to Gerd, who is the UNDP Re Bangkok Regional Hubs Manager, to please share some opening remarks for today. Thank you, Gerd. Over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Chairing, and greetings to you all. Thank you all for, for joining. And uh, special greetings to a lot of uh, old friends and new friends in two different regions. Beate, thank you for making time from Beijing. Uh, colleagues from different countries in the region here in Asia Pacific, but also the uh, Europe and uh, Central Asia uh, Bureau of UNDP. Good to see a lot of old friends, I was about to say, but I should say young friends from old times uh, is a better way of putting it. Uh, so good to see Tiffany, Cornelio, Umutai, um, and many of the colleagues in Istanbul. Um, and it's, I'm really um, excited about today. I don't really use that word excited that often. And my blue background also shouldn't take away from, from the level of excitement. I would have turned purple as you all did if my device had played uh, ball with me, but uh, it, it didn't. I was really looking forward to, to this event for a while because it has brings together two components that are really important to me. We have been working on this STEM study for quite a while. It's been a collaborative effort very closely with the country office in, in China under Beata's leadership, but also important contributions from the UNDP offices in Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and Maldives. So having a moment to really dive deeper into what's behind the STEM study and why we are launching it now is, uh, is a very important feature of, of today's launch event. And this launch of the, of the study, uh, together with the STEM for All platform um, expansion, if I can put it that way, fits really well under the overall mo motto of uh, this year's International Women's Day, you know, uh, invest in women, accelerating progress. That's exactly um, what it is all about. So we, up front, uh, let me add a big thank you to all the colleagues who have been and participating officers who have been part of the study. We're glad to have this in front of you um, and look forward to hearing more about the findings. But equally, a big thank you to Tiffany, Umutai, Cornelio and colleagues in in um, the RBEC part of UNDP's world. For those of you who are not with UNDP, we have make acronyms for everything, and RBEC means a region that's Europe and Central Asia. Um, I'm glad to reconnect and to see a, a, a platform expanding that we've been working on before uh, together for a number of years that has really become a very interesting um, meeting point, if you wish, for STEMinists, but also for many colleagues who are active and interested in helping to move barriers around around women in STEM. So a really great job, uh, Tiffany and Umuta in particular, over, over a number of years to bring it to, to where you have actually brought it. And seeing it expanding into Asia Pacific is, is, a, is particularly close to my heart right now because you know this region is known for its rapid technological advancements, but it also sees the almost the lowest representation of women in STEM compared to the global average and to many other regions. The, so there's something here uh, which we really need to find a way to address. And I think doing this both in a, in a, in form of a, of a deep dive uh, study, but also in terms of a, of, a, of a platform that brings us together and allows us to take this forward uh, step by step is a, is a very, very good uh, combination. We see these gender gaps persisting throughout the years in Asia Pacific and at all levels of STEM disciplines. Um, in the region as well as, as globally. And um, I should say that this is not just about SDG 5. No, this is not just about gender equality. This is really about a core element of the SDG agenda, the Ad Agenda 2030 at large to make this work and to make, uh, to make this happen. So reaching gender equality in STEM is something that is not about um, individual groups. It's about policymakers. It's about educators. 
It's about the private sector. It's about parents. It's about everyone who has a role to play in helping uh, break barriers that have been too persistent for far too long for the world to make to make progress. So all of this together makes me uh, really excited to, to today to join you in this launch and to listen in to the different elements of the agenda. And I'm really particularly pleased, Beata, that you joined from from China. Good, to, good to have you. And for to my colleagues from Arbeck um, for for joining in as well. This is not the end. The launch is the beginning of a process. So I look forward to how we jointly make a dent when it comes to the women in STEM across the two regions, across women in Asia overall, and that means Central Asia, Asia in the, in the um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia context, but also in the Pacific. On that note, let me, let me stop uh, chairing and thank you for, for moderating this overall, and actually for having been one of the colleagues who have seen this through early on. So a special thank you to you personally as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerd. Uh, I think your opening request was really, really excellent to st set the stage for today and also the context that we're working in, given the low representation and underrepresentation of women in Asia Pacific and also the importance of why we are expanding uh, the partnership on through the STEM for All platform. Uh, with this, I'll also now like to invite Stelena, who is the hub manager for Istanbul Regional Hub, for her remarks on our collaboration. Over to you, Tiffany. Oh, we can't hear. Can you just increase the volume? Please? Greetings to all participants and based the launch of the collaboration between Regional Bureau for Europe and Asia and the Regional Bureau for Asia Pacific. Around the initiative of STEM for All and taking this collaboration of STEM for All to a cross regional level. I'm very happy that this is a start. And I have to acknowledge the role of Gian Trogema, who was with the Istanbul Regional Hub back when this initiative started in our region, and now as an inspiration for taking this topic for greater uh, work in the region of Asia Pacific. The STEM role is an initiative that started in 2021 by UNDP, and then UNICEF in the region of Europe and Central Asia has joined it. And the initiative focus on creating a space where women and girls who are interested in the STEM skills can come together for finding resources, for um, looking at the local ways, but also increasing their chance for professional development for learning and for working together. The more valuable part of the platform is the STEM network. This is where the, uh, the, the meeting point is the most important tool and generate a lot of interest and we see a massive growth of number of participants. We believe that taking this joint collaboration between the two regions and activating it long today will give us a strong motivation for um, expanding faster the uh, knowledge and the way of how we can help women and girls to find themselves more uh, with STEM skills in the areas which are frontier for development, the green transitions, the transformations that our societies have gone through, but not only applying the digital in our spheres of life. I'm sure that the meet today will be exciting and will originate a lot of interest. On our side, we are ready to work together and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, uh... Thank you, thank you for the video. I think that we had some issues with the volume, but uh, I hope uh, colleagues and uh, participants joining here today could hear uh, properly later because it, we try to reduce the volume a little lower. Um, so to begin with, I guess uh, now we'll go to the next next segment of uh, the agenda today, which is uh, staring, sharing uh, the findings uh, from the STEM study that was conducted. Uh, but before that, I would also like to invite Beate, who is the resident representative of UNDP China Country Office,
to share a brief background on the STEM study initiative. And as mentioned by Gerd earlier, uh, this has been a collaboration with the, the China country office. And uh, we are very uh, indeed happy to uh, inform that China has been taking the lead in terms of uh, some of the STEM initiatives in the region. So Beate, over to you for a brief uh, background. Thank you so much, uh, sharing and uh, uh, a warm hello from China to colleagues and friends from across the Asia Pacific region and uh, Europe. Uh, Gerd, indeed, uh, very nice to, to see you as an old UNDP uh, friend. And I think we also have uh, a number of external uh, partners on, online. So uh, greetings from China to our uh, partners and, and STEMnists in uh, the Asia Pacific and uh, uh, Europe uh, region. It's really a, a great pleasure joining you uh, for this uh, discussion uh, today. We, we all know we live in an era of rapid innovation in science and technology, where cutting edge research and new technological breakthroughs are transforming our world. And they offer valuable solutions to address the really daunting challenges facing humanity and our survival from the climate uh, emergency to environmental degradation and poverty and inequality. But that said, unless these solutions are inclusive, where all have an opportunity not only to benefit from their application, but crucially also to participate in their design, their potential for sustainable development can't be fully maximized. And worse yet, they can lead, in fact, to further increasing digital divides that then further marginalize vulnerable groups. And so that's why we at UNDP China made a conscious decision to make the pursuit of gender equality in STEM a critical priority of our work here. The regional study that we're launching today is in a way the latest in a series of initiatives that our office here has been engaged in over the last several years. To promote women in science and technology and explore solutions to close the gender divide in STEM fields. So these initiatives, they range from, and I give you a few examples, uh, multiple advoc uh, advocacy campaigns that we have conducted with over 200 uh, million total views that featured female researchers and tech leaders to share their stories on gender biases in their professions, but then also to encourage women and young girls to pursue interests in STEM. We also have our STEM boot camp, which helped over 1,100 teenage girls in rural areas across China enhance their digital literacy, understanding of new technologies and SDG knowledge. And these newly acquired skills led the girls, and this was really heartwarming. I actually did a field visit uh, last year to uh, uh, Chengdu to witness it myself. So this led the girls to design innovative tech-based solutions to address sustainable development challenges in their community. And we've also uh, organized two policy dialogues in collaboration with the China Women's Association for Science and Technology that convened experts from 11 countries for an exchange on good practices to empower women in science and technology. Now, what we have learned from these engagements and experiences, particularly also through the policy dialogues, is that the challenges facing women in STEM are not specific to China. They are, in fact, common to most countries around the world. And indeed, we know women currently account for only one third of researchers globally. And that this number drops even further or lower if we look at the Asia Pacific region. So this is what then led us to work together with the gender team in RBAP last year to initiate this cross-country study that we are really thrilled to be 
launching today. And so the study highlights, as uh, Gerd was already saying, the challenges of gender equality in STEM in five countries, China, Thailand, Malaysia, Maldives, and Indonesia. And it also outlines approaches for promoting and empowering more women to pursue STEM studies and careers. Now, by mapping out areas of convergence across countries, we can in fact better understand the root causes of the STEM gender gap and learn how it's being tackled in different country contexts and leverage best practices across the region or the two re the region in fact, yes, to improve women's representation and leadership in these currently still very male dominated fields. So I, for myself, look very much forward to hearing shortly from sharing our colleague who will share more details about the regional study, including the specific key findings and recommendations. So in closing, let me just express my sincere thanks to colleagues from our gender team in Bangkok and the country offices throughout the region that worked on the study and made this launch, launch event today possible. At UNEP China, we are committed to building on the insights shared today together with all stakeholders, including policymakers, educators, the private sectors, the families, the parents, as uh, uh, Gerd was saying, it does take the whole will village to design effective approaches to achieve gender equality in STEM. I think it is very obvious that today's global challenges cannot be solved with the brain power of just half the world. And only by harnessing the ingenuity and contributions of all, and in particular the talent pool that we have with the women, can we hope to create a more inclusive and sustainable future for everyone. So that, with that, let me thank you all for the great collaboration and looking forward to hearing uh, from you all and taking this forward now from the study to implementing uh, recommendations and specific steps in our countries. Thank you all and back to you, Sherry. Thank you, Beatrice, for this uh, um, background that you have given about China and how this whole uh, STEM study was initiated. Uh, it's also great that you mentioned, uh, although we do a lot of studies, it's also important that we ensure that we follow through and see how what kind of recommendations that we can take forward. And I believe today's uh, um, uh, webinar is also one of them. Uh, there was a recommendation that we have some kind of regional initiatives uh, to advocate as well as to bring in STEMness and then to have ideas on how we can uh, you know, increase women's representation in STEM. So thank you for that, Beatrice. And then I'll also like to echo what you said, uh, uh, thanking all the country offices, colleagues who have contributed uh, from Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Maldives, um, uh, and also um, uh, Malaysia, Maldives, Thailand, China, and uh, one more country. Sorry, I just missed, but I'll, I'll, I'll share that again in my presentation later. Uh, with this, I will uh, now um, uh, share the presentation of the findings. But before we get into it, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the pen holders, I would say, uh, from China Country Office, who was Fei, who was the gender specialist, and also a consultant who worked very closely with us, with BRA gender team, uh, Floringa, as well as our gender team uh, lead, Ko, uh, who has helped us guide uh, the, uh, the, the study today that I'll be sharing. So um, let me just share my screen. Please let me know if you can. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, let me just. I'll just to make sure I don't. Uh, so like I said, um, today is the in the launch, we will be sharing some of the key findings and uh, due to limited time, we might not have uh, enough, uh, you know, like time to go deep dive into uh, some of the findings, but we will be pointing out uh, some key recommendations too. Uh, so just a brief background into 
why we uh, went uh, into the study. Uh, as you know, in the fourth industrial revolution, like uh, mentioned by Good and as well as Pete, that uh, you know STEM skills are vital, and as also because when we are addressing some of the critical issues like climate change, um, uh, green development. Um, uh, and the like, uh, we realize that STEM is vital and also to make sure that we are in line with uh, meeting some of the sustainable development goals. Uh, the Asia Pacific region, as we said, is facing a lot of challenges in meeting the demand uh, for suitably qualified workers in STEM. Um, uh, but then we also realize there's also lack of data. Uh, uh, but then uh, evidence suggests that uh, the representation of women in STEM is uh, pretty low. Uh, so in order to navigate uh, Industry 4.0, we needed to understand what were some of the barriers uh, in women's participation in STEM and also some of the existing gender biases in STEM-related fields, um, uh, which is resulting in women being underrepresented, undervalued, and underpaid. Uh, so the implications of not having gender gaps in STEM is that they will be biased in the design. As more and more technologies start getting introduced, we realize that uh, if there's not good representation or equal representation, it could also be biased in the kind of design and application. Uh, there's also the risk that human resource and skill def deficit will be there impacting development. And of course, like you said earlier, the obstacles to sustainable development. Well, uh, when we embarked on the study, uh, the objective of the research was basically to explore the trends and patterns that was currently unfolding in the region uh, and also to provide a qualitative an an analysis of emerging issues facing uh, women and girls in STEM uh, across China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Maldives and Thailand. Um, so uh, these were the key uh, country offices that participated in the research. So basically, the uh, Three specific uh, objective was we wanted to map the key challenges and opportunities for women in STEM, uh, also to capture best practices and examples uh, that can demonstrate effective approaches for promoting women in STEM, and also to provide you know practical recommendations for how different stakeholders can promote uh, uh, participation. So methodology um, that we deployed uh, during the study is very. Uh, qualitative in nature. Uh, so we looked at, uh, we deployed the literature review, looking at some of the primary data, uh, already existing data through research uh, that was there. So we did not, uh, you know, come up with any new data or collect any new data, but then what was already existing, uh, then primary data was collected using key informant interviews and focus group discussions across the five countries that we mentioned and who participated in the study. And also, we, as much as possible, we tried to capture the voices of diverse stakeholders, as you can see uh, from the CSOs, from the education sector, from media, private sector, some also from the UN agency, and also policy makers in all the five country offices that, we, um, partic that participated in this study. So again, we do have limitations, like we said. Uh, so there is significant uh, data gap that exists across the countries that was included in the research. So this study is really based on only the available data and also the qualitative data that we deployed uh, through the focus group discussion, key involvement interviews, and also collecting from uh, respective countries' uh, uh, literature review. Uh, then common challenges across the STEM sectors, uh, we just looked at just the common uh, challenges and not specific challenges faced by subsectors, for example, uh, engineering or maybe in the, uh, in the area of private sector and technology. So we looked at it from a very broad perspective. We did not zoom down into any specific uh, STEM field. Uh, so essentially, like I said earlier, it's a qualitative study and the sample is not meant to be representative of stakeholders working women across the region. So as we said earlier that it is only a few country office that participated, so it might not be representative of all uh, uh, across the region. Uh, because of limited time and sampling, most respondents uh, that we reached out to were from the capital cities. So we do acknowledge that the nuances and interests of women at sub-regional level 
especially women in rural and remote areas were not you know adequately captured by the research and which we feel uh, is also one of the challenges um, in in collecting data from uh, so research we also limitation is that research findings do not adequately capture the diverse identities of women in stem so we might and the impact or uh, the gender or that can have from gender orientation geography ethnicity disability age and other identities uh, that can have barriers and uh, that can uh, also promote uh, opportunities for women in uh, stem so these were some of the few key limitations that uh, we had from the study uh, so key findings, like we said, colleagues, uh, only the key findings, I'm sure you all must have got an opportunity to have a look at uh, the study in detail. Um, so as we said earlier, we found out from the data that is available uh, uh, through literature review uh, and data collected from the countries, uh, we found out that women compromise, uh, comprise around 23.9% of STEM researchers in the Asia Pacific. Uh, which is lower than the global average of 29.3%. As it is globally also, women's representation is low, but um, the Asia-Pacific uh, is lower than even the global uh, one. So STEM has been recognized as a priority for all the five countries included in this research. And there, of course, there is also significant uh, efforts that have been made to promote the participation of women and girls in STEM. Uh, so, but then, uh, like we said earlier, it's important to acknowledge that despite these uh, advances, uh, women still continue to face uh, uh, barriers and there still exist disparities. For example, if you look at uh, the countries and the different STEM sector uh, in engineering, you will see that there's very less representation in all the countries, uh, while in health and welfare, women's uh, uh, you know, uh, representation uh, and participation is little higher. So, uh, in the science sector, uh, the representation is little low. Um, so, another key findings uh, is, uh, you know, throughout uh, childhood, we found out that uh, uh, women and uh, face barriers, uh, especially in terms of biases. At a very young age, uh, it is uh, the boys who are given more preference. Uh, there's also um, the feeling that, you know, their gender stereotypes uh, also hinder participation of women, even the perception of, uh, you know, the parents in terms of who they want to send uh, the children. If it's a boy or a girl, then it would always be the girl who would be uh, given more preference to, to study. In, uh, so there is a bias belief that boys uh, or men uh, perform much better. And this, uh, hinders women or is a challenge for girls' participation, even in uh, the education system. Again, again, uh, as we move further, uh, the academic streaming or the funneling. So when uh, when children have to, uh, you know, choose specific subjects, that is where, again, filtering happens. And it seems that the boys are given more preference. Uh, the, there is also a lot of biases in terms of teaching methodology and teachers' perception. It seems many teachers also have the bias feeling that uh, boys perform better and encourage the boys to do uh, uh, to take up STEM studies uh, more than uh, the girls. Uh, in higher education, there seems to be rural and urban divide. So as uh, children again, uh, you know, climb up the ladder in higher education, it, there is already a rural and urban divide in terms of access to STEM education. Uh, and um, many of the STEM opportunities are, of course, uh, in terms of vocational education, uh, it is there in the rural uh, urban areas. So many parents would you not want to send their girl, girls uh, to urban uh, schools or urban cities to uh, access those opportunities. Um, then uh, again, as we go up in the career development, uh, there is cultural stereotype and uh, there is also, because of that, career motivation is less for women. Uh, there are not enough flexibility in terms, because of the demanding work uh, in STEM, uh, many of the private sector uh, prefer to employ um, uh, women. And uh, also, it seems that many of the, uh, sorry, many, many of the <clears throat> industries or uh, let's say the private sector that is uh, technology uh, focused uh, do not have flexible working conditions uh, that could limit women from um, taking up uh, uh, um, STEM careers. 
uh, it's also a male dominated workplace and women because of that women don't have enough role models to look up to um, so there's also an issue of sexual abuse exploitation and harassment uh, oftentimes we will find that there are very few women who are in this area of stem uh, working uh, and then they find themselves alone among a lot of uh, uh, men and uh, are vulnerable to sexual exploitation abuse and then um, this also is dissuading them from joining the STEM sector. Um, so as you can see from here, uh, this is uh, uh, called the, oops, the oops, sorry, um, leaky, uh, like it has a metaphor that has been used, uh, so leaky pipeline uh, in the same sector, starting from childhood to early education and higher education. So they, uh, in, in a nutshell, there's a biased belief that boys and men perform better than girls and women in science. And uh, so even uh, towards, there is already bias even when they're pursuing STEM education careers later in life. Uh, and, and in the Asia Pacific, and I believe it's not just Asia Pacific, but across the globe, uh, you know, their expectations, uh, social expectation, that encourage women to prioritize family over careers and education. So you find that many of uh, the women prefer not to get into STEM um, careers because of the work-life balance and the intensive and challenging uh, work environment that they face. Uh, so while globally more women and girls are studying STEM uh, ma majors in higher education, uh, women take to take longer time to land in STEM jobs. And there's also a little discrepancy in the kind of salaries that women and men are paid uh, in the STEM sector. So uh, there's also various factors that hinder women from entering and progressing in STEM workforce, including, like I said, gender biases and stereotypes. Uh, and again, uh, if you look at uh, the whole career or the workforce in the STEM, you will not see many women in leadership position. Um, so there's very less social capital or uh, for women or role models for women to look up to and pursue this career. Uh, but again, uh, during the course of the study, we found that there are some good practices that are happening uh, to, in, to encourage women uh, to take up STEM or to uh, ensure the increase of uh, representation of women and participation of women and girls. So there's a lot of advocacy like we're doing right now uh, across Asia Pacific uh, that is uh, being promoted. Uh, uh, even the education system uh, actually is trying their best to uh, make sure that uh, they, en they enroll girls into STEM. Uh, for example, there are policy initiatives uh, whereby you know vocational trainings, institutions are giving quota system or even giving scholarship uh, to uh, to girls to pursue to pursue the stem um, education uh, and also partnership with some private sector but partnership with universities uh, to give direct opportunities again to uh, girls and women in stem uh, now quickly i'll share some of the recommendations that we uh, came up uh, through our uh, study is, uh, you know, for educators and policymakers and also in terms of career support and also networking to expand scholarship opportunities, which is already happening. But I believe that there is uh, a need to, you know, really beef up uh, these opportunities to encourage women and girls. Uh, then also to promote gender responsive STEM pedagogy at all levels of education, uh, starting from early childhood to vocational uh, education to expand um, vocational education opportunities in the field of STEM to increase uh, non-traditional STEM education pathways. Uh, for policymakers, of course, there is a dire need to promote the collection of uh, uh, and uh, analysis of data on women so that we, they know exactly where the intervention should happen uh, and what kind of intervention can really support uh, equality uh, in this uh, field. Uh, to promote inclusion and advancement of uh, women in STEM fields through active participation for women uh, in uh, national research or even development programs. And also to ensure the provision of adequate public services such as, you know, child care, elderly care or domestic uh, service facilities so that, you know, you have adequate work-life balance uh, for women to equally participate. 
uh, also in terms of career opportunities and support uh, uh, to expand scholarship like we uh, mentioned earlier, but also to establish mentorship programs to design and implement uh, female specific leadership uh, trainings, which is really lacking um, uh, women's uh, representation. Uh, to encourage and support formation of women's associations and network uh, that can really bolster or encourage women and support each other uh, and provide resources uh, and support to help uh, associations establish themselves um, to organize regular meetings and seminars and, and to provide platform for exchange. Uh, so these were some uh, policy recommendations for different, uh, you know, uh, um, um, stakeholders. Uh, for recommendations specifically for UNDP was uh, to contribute to new knowledge on women in STEM through research on key issues. Like we said, this is just a general one. Maybe we could focus or uh, dig a deep dive into uh, some uh, really uh, critical skills or critical areas of STEM. Uh, support data initiatives that seek to build uh, evidence base. Again, uh, going back to research. Uh, our mainstream STEM into existing programs. As we know that uh, UNDP has, uh, is an organization that focuses on diverse uh, fields uh, and development programs. So how can we encourage that to be mainstream? Uh, for example, women's entrepreneurship in the agriculture and livelihoods area, climate change adaptation. So how can we mainstream STEM skills and promote equality there? To collaborate with government and academic institutions and the private sector, I believe we play, that it will be very essential uh, to do uh, as we encourage and recognize uh, that gender equality practices within the STEM sectors are needed. Uh, then identify and support direct opportunities that provide competitive grants and fundings uh, and innovation that are led by women and organize regional for, for forums and uh, collaborations. And of course, uh, advocacy messages that already is happening, but how can we enhance that and uh, support countries for cross-regional or uh, existing um, to join or to connect them to uh, global networks of women in STEM. So this is in, in a nutshell, um, some of the recommendations uh, and some of the key um, findings from the study. Like we said, uh, this is a very small sample size and a very small study that we um, initiated uh, through the BR agenda team and the collaborating country offices. Uh, so with this, we will uh, open the floor. Uh, Tiffany, sorry, I'm, I'm not very, sure whether we have time, should we go to the next segment or take a few questions or can we go into um, the Q&A? We can take one question. We're running, but it's, it's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so colleagues, uh, any questions or maybe we park the questions for now and uh, move to the next segment of in the agenda, which is the panel discussion. Uh, if there are any questions, fee please feel free to drop it uh, in the chat boxes, but uh, we'll also have a little time later after the panel discussions, if there's question for the study, as well as to the panelists uh, who will be sharing uh, their journeys uh, in being uh, part of the STEM uh, profession. Uh, so with this, I hand over to Tiffany, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Uh, we have three very interesting and inspiring role models uh, in the STEM sector from Asia Pacific, um, which and from diverse country office. Uh, I mean countries. So I'll hand over to Tiffany, who will moderate. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm also doing. Let's see. Great. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I am pleased to uh, moderate this panel. Um, and despite all the barriers that we just um, heard about, I am very happy to be able to talk to the three women that have actually um, have broken down these barriers and are amazing women in STEM. So we have first, and let me spotlight them. Um, and then, Okay, 
So first we have um, Aisha. She's an experienced technology management professional, renowned for her expertise across mobile domains within the tech sector in the Maldives. As a deputy manager of information system at Allied Insurance Company, she leads software development team. She's passionate for gender equality in tech fields. She co-founded Women in Tech Maldives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering, inspiring, and celebrating women in science and technology. And next, we have Dr. Maha Arujanan. She has a PhD in science communication and was the first one in Malaysia ever to do a PhD in the field. Um, she's trained in biotechnology and microbiology. She founded the first science newspaper in Malaysia called the Petri Dish. I love that name. Um, the age short course on agrobiotechnology, biosafety, and communication. And she also co founded Science Media Center in Malaysia. She regularly speaks and trains around the globe. And finally, we have Alia Sara. She's currently head of program planning and control at Project Management Office, Keratu Bali, Ministry of National Development Planning of Indonesia for the Bali Economic Transformation. Prior to this job, she worked as the head of railway engineering department on um, MRT Jakarta. Her previous employment prior to MRT Jakarta, she worked as a signaling designer at Jacob Selborne, an engineering consulting company for three years consisting of engineering roles in Melbourne-based regional rail link, Seeing their nightmares, respectively. And she has her bachelor's in information system and a graduate diploma in rail signaling and telecom railway and railroad transportation for Central Queensland University. So we are in the midst of greatness here. So I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to do um, a couple of questions. Um, start with Aish first, who's co founder of Women in Telecom at D. So as the founder of this nonprofit, you're playing a very important role in promoting gender equality within the tech industry in an island nation context. So then this big global push that we're seeing towards more inclusive economies, and we're seeing a critical role of technology um, in achieving the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. What specific policies or initiatives do you think are very critical for small island developing states to advance this participation in STEM, especially in decision-making roles, in leadership roles, as we saw in this city, you know, there's the leaky pipeline and e-women who make it, you know, on, don't make it all the way up to top. Um, so how can policymakers and development practitioners support these efforts? Uh, well, oh, well. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. And greetings from Maldives to everyone. Yes, um, this is a very, very interesting topic because I've been in almost all the levels in the technology sector and then getting into the leadership levels and, and I'm trying to find more like me. It's it's very, very hard to see them. So uh, what I see is um, today um, the landscape is evolving very, very fast. So uh, together in the Maldives and other places, we have seen organizations keep pushing to have more women in the field. But I think right now our focus should also be on getting them into that leadership positions because that's where they, they, they can actually make the, that change, open up more opportunities for women and girls to join the sector. So... Um, Particularly when you look at to small island um, nations, you can see that government cannot do everything alone. So it is the private sector that comes in and also we can see the rise of the startups. Um, they, ch they are, ch they are uh, changing the world, but we see very few women led startups, especially in the STEM, STEM fields. So this uh, represents a missed opportunity for innovation and diversity. Uh, what I see is for the small island nation, one of the key things is to ensure that women have this space, especially in changing the communities and being part of these startups, um, uh, prioritizing um, uh, opportunities for women to lead startups is crucial now because that is one way definitely you will see the change in the country as well as they can open up for the global markets. So that is definitely one thing I would like to see um, nations and other organizations keep 
focusing on that, be it funding, funding or other resources, skill development, opening up the doors for women. Another area that I see is that uh, can we really wait for everyone to train and come and then take another 10 years and then become a leader? No, we don't have that time. So uh, one of the things that I would um, say is that why not focusing on upskilling programs? Like there are, we have good leaders or upcoming female leaders. Why not give them that skill and that support so that they can lead the technology sectors or the STEM fields? So that is uh, definitely one thing that I see. And um, something that we have actually done in the Maldives is creating that our visibility campaigns to have more women in the technology sector. I think similarly for SIDS, if you consider uh, bring, uh, giving that visibility or celebrating women's work uh, can actually inspire more women to join the leadership roles as well as for the private sector and other organizations to, um, uh, to say that they also have these opportunities. So with that, when the private sector comes in, what happens is the way that communities see it totally changes they see the progress. So um, those are some of the key things. Yes, I, I think uh, we can um, do on having more leaders in the STEM field. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, very interesting. Um, and the work that you're doing too, you're really helping to amplify more role models in the world. And I think the technology is able to do that a lot faster and you know expand our reach. And interesting, you're saying that government can't do this alone, that we need to help um, the help of society. And it leads me to our next um, panelist, who is a science communication um, specialist, and Dr. moved to Dr. Maha. I find this very interesting because I think it is, there is a big gap between um, public, what they perceive, and then like the scientists, and even like, especially amongst the policymakers, who are in the driver's seat. So Dr. Maha, as someone who's navigated the spaces, right, of both science uh, practice, uh, practice and science communication, <clears throat> you definitely bring this unique perspective to the table, um, especially in explaining very complex concepts. Um, considering your experience, how do you perceive the current understanding of policymakers regarding barriers to diversity and inclusion, STEM fields? especially when it comes to decision-making roles and what strategies do you believe could effectively inform and guide policymakers to develop and, and embed, right? So it's not just this tack on policy, but how can we embed it more in some diversity enhancing policies and STEM education and careers? You. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank, Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, science communication. If you look at science communication, it is still a, a relatively new field, about 50 years old compared to any other sciences. And um, in many developing countries, in fact, even developed countries, this is still uh, there is still no focus on science communication at the national level. There, are, there is no dedicated resources and capacity building programs. So what I do is like, I, I'm like a hybrid. Yes, I, my PhD is in science communication, but I also consider my myself as a generalist. And I think it's so important for us to be a generalist in my field because I have to communicate many areas, not just what I'm trained in, which is microbiology and biochemistry and biotechnology, but also engineering and nuclear science and AI and all these things. So it's so important. And looking at the emerging technologies, like what you rightfully said, there is definitely a lot, um, a, a big gap um, you mentioned public. Now, when for us in science communication, when we say public, it's not just the public you see in the train station or in the malls, but um, experts can also be public. I'm trained in biotechnology. If you are an engineer, then I'm also in a public to you, your field because I need explanation. I need that to be simplified. So we are public to each other as well. That is how we um, define public in science communication. And certainly policymakers and politicians are all public unless they have at least some basic training in certain areas of science. So with that um, gap, now we see a lot of um, barriers or uh, in terms of knowledge barriers between the policymakers and the scientists. And this is where it's leading to policy uh, policies or regulations that may look good or, in fact, those, you know, they cannot be implemented well. 
that they can be impractical. Uh, they can stifle research, development, commercialization, and also uh, regulations that can, um, you know, very risk averse. We see a lot of policymakers, politicians are very risk averse uh, when it comes to new technologies. And this is where science communication plays a role. Now, if I want to tweak it to gender, now science communication plays a big role. We saw the finding of this study and where women are still lagging behind in many areas, in many disciplines, in many countries. This is where science communication can actually help uh, women uh, to elevate themselves. How do they pitch their research to the investors? So, you know, men probably do it better because of the long history uh, of them being in the field and their networking skills. So we, you know, this is what I do as well. I train women um, scientists. Uh, how do you pitch to investors? How do you pitch to collaborators? How do you uh, do networking? So this is also very important. So when we say public, it really... Um, you know, it comprises a, a number of stakeholders. So as a science communication, I work along the entire supply chain of science. So from research and then development, commercialization, and there comes investors and um, uh, policymakers, regulators, politicians, the public, because we need social licensing. A number of new technologies, especially if it is like controversial, even mRNA vaccine was controversial in the beginning. Um, so, you know, these new things, um, gene genetic modification, gene editing, nuclear technology, uh, and uh, cell, cell therapy, for example, this all can be controversial. So we need the policymakers and the public to understand as well, for the public also to accept it. So this is where the, we work along the supply chain, working with all stakeholders to make them understand. And it will be really great uh, I think for more women to come into this field, you know, women, naturally, I think we can... Um, uh, interweave emotion and culture and believe into science in communicating science because when we communicate science it's not just about the science science alone we won't be able to influence uh, uh, policies or even opinions we need all the other social um, social science or social behavior as well so this is where i think it will be a very great um uh, field for women to excel so that is what I do and um, it's very exciting and I think it's the the it, the demand is growing because of the new technologies and people uh, you know even the uh, the uh, those in power they realize that science has to be communicated and there is a gap so it's a growing field thank you thank you yeah I agree I actually have met some people who have gone into science communication and created like YouTube channels, like even for, for young kids and for, yeah, just for, for the public, but for sure, I mean, for policymakers as well, you know, they don't have information and sometimes it's fear, right? And uncertainty of what science is. And so I, I, I really love this new, new field in science communication and, and interesting point that, um, that women might make, um, make really good um, uh, people who can communicate. But that's also leads me to our last speaker because I was thinking about data collection and maybe with evidence and better data, we can also be able to communicate this um, and convince people that we do need diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we'll move on to Alia Sam. She's the head of program planning control at the Bali Economic Transformation. Um, so in your job, you oversee these initiatives that have the significant potential to transform form infrastructure. So recognizing we're all talking about how gender equality is a, is a key driver of sustainable development. Um, can you share what kind of data you collect um, to ensure that programs and policies, actions are gender mainstream, are half, you know, it's embedded, it's hardwired into the program. Do you encounter challenges in this endeavor and, and how do you address them if you do? Over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Tiffany. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, ensuring uh, gender equality is a, a fundamental aspect of sustainable development, uh, especially in initiative aimed at infrastructure transformation. So, uh, as the head of uh, program planning and control for uh, Bali Economic Transformation, uh, we take a comprehensive approach uh to gender mainstreaming by collecting various uh, types of data and because of one of the strategy of bali economic transformation is bali pintar we call it bali pintar which is in english is uh, bali smart 
with the focus on building capacity and the capability of people. So um, firstly, uh, we gather this aggregated data to understand the uh, specific needs, uh, prioritize and um, uh, experience of women and men uh, within the communities uh, affected by uh, our initiative. And um, this includes data on access to and usage of the uh, infrastructure, employment patterns, uh, income levels, and the uh, decision-making power. Uh, secondly, we conduct gender impact assessment to um, evaluate how our programs, uh, policies, and action uh, may affect women and uh, men differently. And this helps us identify potential disparities and opportunities uh, to promote gender equality throughout the uh, project life cycle. Uh, additionally, uh, we also prioritize the uh, inclusion of uh, women in decision-making process and leadership roles. Uh, it, it was mentioned by the uh, two uh, women before and ensuring uh, their voices are heard and uh, their perspective are integrated into project planning and implementation. So yes, of course, so uh, we do encounter some challenges uh, include cultural norms and biases that uh, may limit women's uh, participation uh, in adequate sex, uh, disaggregated data availability and limited resources for gender mainstreaming activities. Yes, there's some uh, challenges of that. So uh, to address these challenges, uh, we take proactive measures such as um, uh, conducting gender sensitization training for staff and stakeholders, uh, partnering with local uh, women's community or organization to amplify women's voices and uh, advocating uh, for increased investment in gender responsive infrastructure development. So uh, by continuously monitoring and evaluating our effort, uh, we strive to overcome barriers to gender equality and uh, ensure that our programs contribute to inclusive and sustainable uh, development for all. Thank you so much for, for the work that you do. Um, I guess if we can end, we have one more question for everybody. It's kind of a later question and um, socially I put this in here. <laughs> um, with apps becoming crucial tools for productivity, learning and connection, I'm curious and hopefully everyone else is curious to know which app you love the most. Like what is one app you can't live without and why? Is there a particular app that significantly impacted your work or daily routine? cook your dinner for you. I don't know, what have you? I'm, I'm interested in knowing. So uh, maybe we can start. Tengu, do you want to start? And we can go in reverse. Okay, certainly. Uh, one app that has, uh, that has significantly impacted my work and uh, daily routine is Evernote. Uh, I've been using this app since uh, 2008. So uh, I love this app because uh, it has the uh, organization feature and this app is allow me to capture ideas, uh, make to-do lists, uh, take notes during meeting and uh, even I can save uh, web articles uh, or document for uh, letter references. Uh, and this, uh, I can do this in all in one place, which is in this app. And uh, this app also has uh, syncing capabilities across the, de the devices uh, to ensure that I have uh, access to my notes and um, some information wherever I go. So which is um, is uh, very convenient for me uh, and anybody uh, with a busy schedule. Uh, it has the ability also to take notes and create notebooks. Uh, so it helps me stay organized and easily find what I need uh, when I need it. So uh, also Evernote's uh, collaboration features uh, have been invaluable for uh, team projects. So it's allowing seamless sharing and editing of notes among colleagues. So I use this uh, with my team as well to, so we can share uh, what we have. So overall, this uh, app has become a tool for, for me, uh, especially for me for increasing my productivity. Uh, I stay organized and effectively, effectively uh, managing my workflow. Thank you. 
Yep. Ms. McKay Evernote. <laughs> Dr. Maha, how about you? Okay, I'm, I'm going, going to be a rebel. I'm not going to choose one. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, as a science communicator, I'm very active on my social media. So that's LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and now uh, TikTok. And uh, I find that um, this um, for women, I think, again, you know, for women and, of course, any experts, we need more experts to go on social media um, as a tool to create awareness on the field that we do and to engage others. I spoke about the gap in knowledge and to inspire other women and girls because then they see us as an expert, they see as an authority, and we become their role model. And uh, then they see real person doing different things in, in STEM field. So I think this is very important. Now, you will also be um, surprised if I say I get invitations because of my presence on social media. They see what I do, and then um, invitation to speak, to train, and I even get uh, collaborators. Uh, to my LinkedIn, uh, they see, hey, uh, Maha, you do what we are. We really uh, want to do. So can we collaborate? So I get funding from there. And I tell women, these uh, men as well, I tell experts, especially, you know, STEM, because STEM people are naturally introvert. So in social media, you can be an introvert uh, and you can still don't see anyone uh, physically, but you can still put what, um, you know, uh, um, uh, post what you do. Um, so I, I think it's really very important for scientists, for experts in STEM, STEM practitioners to be on social media, and especially um, women. But increasingly, I'm also using all those um, AI uh, platforms, um, large uh, language uh, body, uh, a, uh, Gemini AI and Chat uh, GPT, because as a science communicator, I think that also helps me to simplify things and give me a different perspective, how I can write things differently. So these are the things that I use. So it's not one Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. That's amazing. And I like the, the idea of social media for introverts. That's, <laughs> you don't have to actually physically be with people. And, and yeah, awesome. And then last, uh, yeah, Aisha, how about you? Um, yeah, and it's like Maha mentioned, it's very, very hard to pick uh, one app. But I echo a lot of things that Maha mentioned because um, when I started using LinkedIn, I initially used it for job hunting, but later it became a sort of a community app where I also get opportunities to speak at events or to collaborate, as well as um, I've joined a lot of groups in LinkedIn where I find opportunities for the communities, especially for the women in tech. And youth opportunities I usually find, be it internships, fellowships, or other conferences. So um, that is uh, definitely one thing that I would not that give um, that brings a change. Another one is the medium, medium, uh, the blogging um, platform. I don't blog, but it's a place where I I go and. Um, check on the opinion, perceptions, and uh, a lot of authentic pieces that people write. So uh, Medium has been really, really helpful. And another thing uh, for the job and all the kind of work that I do, we need to bring out a lot of new features, new apps, and all. I usually go to Product Hunt. Product Hunt is a place where you can stay informed about the latest products developed well, usually uh, by ma main startups and all uprising startups and all where you can actually go and upvote, you can comment, you can see uh, the approaches people have um, taken to build those apps. So that is definitely very, very helpful for me in the job. And apart from that, um, ChatGPT and Copilot are becoming my best friends now. And yeah, so staying ahead with other apps like Instagram and all, you keep pushing and you keep showing the work that you do along with your community. It, it really helps to inspire other women too. Yeah, that's all I think for now. Oh, no, great. Thank you. I mean, amazing that like, technology is a tool, right? That can really help. I mean, there's some risks involved, but it can, you know, it's a good as well. So I think now we can open the floor for questions. We have um, 10 minutes or so. You can come off the mic, feel free, or put your question in the, in the chat as you want. Can I go? Yes, please. Uh, this is, uh... 
our colleagues are a little shy, I think, to open their mics then. <laughs> but please feel free to uh, share uh, any questions to our panelists in the chat box. So um, I have one question each for all the panelists. Uh, so Dr. Maha, like you said, uh, you are one of the first ones uh, to do uh, uh, communication and in technology, all right? Uh, so uh, how do you inspire uh, your uh, female colleagues uh, to follow your footsteps? Um, 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 I'm sure you must be also having male colleagues, but do you ever involve your male colleagues to also join in and encourage them to, you know, uh, support other female colleagues in this thing? So that's one question for you. Uh, Aisha, I believe you're a co-founder for uh, the tech innovation that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, do you see any more, uh, you know, uh, young women um, who are also coming up in your country with such similar innovation and uh, how do you think your country can best support uh, young women who, who want to join this field or who have interesting uh, innovations in technology that uh, they can use uh, and uh, to tengo alia uh, i really like that you're working on data uh, i think you did mention uh, but how can we again uh, increase uh, the collection of data in all the fields that you're talking about to really show that vast discrepancies. Uh, we, we keep in all the fields that we've worked in, especially in gender equality, I think one of uh, why we are also lagging behind is there is a lack of data in terms of, you know, showing the results that we're making towards gender equality. I think uh, uh, the SCAP uh, recently produced uh, the SDG report and uh, one of the findings is that there's very less data to show uh, the progress on uh, gender equality. So I believe you're also facing that. And uh, what are some of your ideas you think uh, that we can use uh, to, to fill that gap or to address data gaps? Uh, so thank you uh, to all the panelists in advance. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the uh, question. Thank you, Sharing. So uh, I don't discriminate between genders and um, I, I train a lot of interns. Uh, the interns love working with us because, you know, um, young people go into STEM uh, with, uh, with uh, no real uh, direction what they're going to do later. So when they go into STEM, especially biotechnology, they think that, okay, you know, sometimes it's offered to them, sometimes it's parents pressure, or sometimes they feel like, okay, I think it's going to be a cool um, uh, field. But when this, um, uh, when they realize what it is, they realize I don't want to be in the lab. So they come to us as interns because I don't go to the lab anymore. Uh, I'm a communicator. I work on policies, regulations, ethics, and even religion and all these things. So they find this very exciting because it's a non-routine job we have got a wide scope uh, so a lot of interns come to us so i and a lot of um boys come to us and um I really, you know, take them out. Uh, I even, uh, wherever possible, uh, even high uh, level meetings where it's not something that's confidential, I bring them, I just say, okay, you can just sit at the um, back row and just observe what is happening and you understand the, understand the discussion and uh, the latest uh, trends and developments and the issues. So that is what I do with both um, young uh, boys and girls who come uh, for training with us. And for women, uh, I encourage um, scientists uh, to um, uh, to be brave enough to communicate. Like yesterday, I had a training session with um, researchers and most of them said, uh, I have uh, declined media interviews. And when I say why, they said, I think because I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want, I think my um, area is still controversial, so I'm not ready to go and speak. Uh, so I told them how you can ha handle, uh, navigate these type of things. Um, that is one. Then the other thing is I, um, no, uh, I, train a lot of um, graduates um, under governments, uh, uh, ministries and agencies. So um, I tell them about the different career scope, uh, uh, different careers in the lab and outside lab and um, you know, things like that. And also I talk about my career. So a, a lot of people see that it's exciting to be a science communicator. So um, I do... I, I do, uh, you know, mentorship as well. If you want to be in science communication, what do you do? How do you look for a job? How do you build your branding? So these are the things that I do, uh, both young people as well as established senior scientists as well. Thank you. Aisha, would you like to take a step to the question, Aisha? Yeah. 
Yes, yes, definitely. I think um, uh, when you mentioned about having um, the work for increase in the part participation of girls, particularly when you talk about ad adolescent girls, um, motives, um, the challenge that we have is we are very geographically dispersed and we have very small island communities. And then um, you see that the investment and the effort go, goes to each island will be very different. And then the outcome you see is also different. So um, even for women in tech models, we run a lot of programs within the island communities with the support from, of course, the government and private sector. What we see is like um, you travel to an island and then you have only 25 or 20 girls to participate in a program. So if we are to run a long-term program, that means they need to have access to devices um, and also the time. So um, these are some of the challenges that, that we see um, here in the Maldives. But uh, I think um, these challenges actually we can mitigate through having uh, computer science in the curriculum part of a curriculum. And also apart from that, we have observed that having innovation camps and hackathons really brings out that innovative talent in girls. So not only um, like training or teaching the subjects, uh, prepare them for, for the world. Because uh, from now on, I, I don't think how the teaching and education landscape will be in the future, whether we will all be still studying like until grade uh, 12. We don't, we don't really know that now because things are changing very fast. But if, if they are studying and if they are coming out, making sure that they are ready to face the industry, face, face the challenges ahead. And also apart from that, as I mentioned earlier, so we can actually work to help these girls come up with innovative ideas, give them skills and uh, help them to launch their businesses. Because not everybody will have the opportunity to go and work for a company, especially in the Maldives, because the, the organizations are limited. And then uh, if they can work from their islands, of course, we have a very good telecommunication. I will say internet penetration rates are very high in the Maldives. So that is one way they can stay in the island and access the country as well as the global market. So I feel like the effort should be put on both on the curriculum as well as the extracurricular activities that is more focused on building these set of skills Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Over to Tengo Alia. <laughs> Yes, hi, Sharing. Thank you for uh, uh, your question. So um, at the moment, we have, uh, as you know, in the uh, in the news that we are going to have a new presidency in Indonesia. So uh, in 2024 is a new approach for uh, Indonesia for collecting data, especially in uh, contribution of women. So um, call, this collection data is still ongoing, uh, sharing what I can tell you, uh, especially for this new program in Bali Economic Transformation. But um, we get some help from the uh, uh, regional officials and we also gather the uh, community to collect some issues uh, to make sure that we can appoint it and focus on the uh, issues. And as I mentioned that uh, maybe it's a, a similar uh, issues with uh, that uh, been faced by uh, uh, Miss Aisha that Bali is a small island and we really uh, we really uh, been uh, very proud with the uh, uh, culture and the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, culture is very strong uh, as a as a, the uh, background for this island so it's uh, some some issues to collecting data because um, uh, because of this uh, some biases and the uh, cultural norm but uh, we're trying to address this issue uh, uh, with uh, carry out some outreach through the uh, community to get more accurate data and uh, we do some socializing and uh, uh, to collecting this data and to go this uh, to the community and some uh, regencies as well. And uh, we get some assistance from donors uh, such as uh, the, from the uh, like a scholarship from the uh, offices. Uh, and this scholarship and donor is uh, to help and to encourage uh, women to uh, participate and uh, contribute. So yeah. 
So we are still collecting the data and we still uh, processing the data, how we do, how we manage uh, with the data, but uh, uh, we are on, on process and we are progressing. Thank you. I see a question in the chat and then we have another goal. So there's a question to the panel. Apart from gender mainstreaming, has there been some disability equity mainstreaming into STEM to encourage persons with disabilities to start up and participate in training? Um, and then the same person asks directly to Aisha, are there special government policies and legislation in the country that support and encourage women startups. We would like to take down the mainstreaming disabilities. I think um, um, I will just try, but then um, from Malaysian experience, uh, we talk so much about gender equality, but we also talk about DEI, which is diversity, equality, and inclusivity uh, beyond gender. All you know, um, it, it could be minorities or, um, for example, disabilities. But then uh, in STEM, I've not heard so much about um, people with disabilities. I think so much more should be done on this. Uh, what we could do is identify the disabilities and um, what they can do within the disability. I'm sure there are things that they can, there'll be you know, special talents or things that they can excel in. So something has to be um, provided, incent uh, incentives or special training provided for them to also excel in um, STEM. Like, you know, the next que uh, question is about startup. So, um, yeah, no, not the next questions are the startup as well. So, you know, these are the things that can be incentivized for uh, people with uh, disab disability. So, I, I put that's what I think I like to say. Anyone else to take that answer? I do during the pandemic. Um, there were a lot of ways that people with disabilities could continue their work and, you know, access to technology, you know, the, the mobility, a lot more awareness around how, you know, how can we mainstream disability equity as well. So I think the pandemic shifted the way that um, our thinking and there are training programs, I think, with the, with the UNDP that will do like upskilling specifically persons with disabilities as well. So there are programs and more awareness around that. Um, and to, and to, just, to just to add to on, add I on, think I now, think, now, now, now with, with, um, uh, I think I, that's a that's an echo. Okay, uh, now with um, digit, dig, digitalization and AI, there are a lot of opportunities for people with physical disabilities. So I think this has to be leveraged as well. I mean, I guess then the question for uh, Aisha about startup. If you want to take that one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, when when we considered Maldives, we don't have specific policies or legislations, but we do see um the government uh, initiatives on um uh, especially for small uh, businesses for women. They have recently opened funding opportunities. Um, things like that. We we see it uh, in different um, administrations, these kind of opportunities opening up for women. And I'm not really sure how much it's been used because that data I, I have not been able to access. So um, when it comes to technology startups, I could say that we don't have, we have very, very few technology um, startups that, uh, that are women led. Other than that, um, what we see is the strategies, but uh, there are broader talks on uh, having uh, working towards uh, uh, what do you call as incubators and accelerators for uh, young entrepreneurs. So that is being built, um, the startup hubs are being built. So I see that if we focus things like, like this in the next five to six years, we'll have quite a good ecosystem in place. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, running a little bit, but we'll take your goal question and then one. Your goal, please. 
Ah, is it me? me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the inspiring conversations. I really enjoy it. And uh, recently, uh, uh, like last December, we had a session with the UNDP Gender Community of Practice and uh, the Future Fellow Team, where we identified the critical impact of technologies on gender equality, like both positively and negatively. For example, uh, when we ask AI to generate uh, women's image for our posters, it automatically creates image uh, of women students for commercial uh, ads, young, slim, and sexy. So it's 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 a lot of like subconsciously reproducing these uh, stereotypes, uh, even for, for for gender work, and we have to be really vigilant to to catch it. And uh, yesterday, my colleague uh, Nadja who is working on women's political participation, and I discuss a growing phenomena uh, of online uh, gender-based violence. So uh, the question uh, to the experts, who might be our partners uh, fr from the private sector to leverage uh, this cutting edge phenomena in combating gender violence and uh, discrimination? And uh, additionally, it, it's not a question, but I really appreciate that you all mentioned cultural norms and uh, that we uh, we should use technologies uh, to better apply uh, behavioral science method. Thank you. Over to you, Tim. Thanks for the question, Will. Does anyone want to start? Um, yes, I, I think I can start. Um, uh, when she mentioned about gender-based um, uh, violence that happens um, online, we, I see a lot of responsibility with um, the platform providers. Usually, um, um, let's say you need to have really th this much big force with you if you were to combat with them. So not everyone is going to have that. So um, identification, these algorithms, usually um, they don't, uh, I, I would say they don't identify um, the bullying and other the other forms of um, uh, violences that happens um, in in the online platforms. So a lot of times, uh, even women in tech motives, we have reported multiple um, um, issues that we, we we see on social media platforms. So, but it takes a lot of time to take um, those um, things down or uh, get flagged. It takes time. So I would say that um, especially governments and a bigger organization needs to work with these platform providers to make sure that social media and these online platforms are safer place for all of us, especially from coming from small island nations. I think uh, the, our voice is much lesser in these platforms. So uh, how, we, how can actually we influence it to, to ensure that there are safer mechanisms for women in these spaces, be it um, the inboxes or the posts that's uh, been done, everything, all the viral things that are going against women. So we need to have a better mechanism in all these platforms. Yeah, that's what how I see it. I can add on my perspective um, to that question. Now, um, AI does not do things on its own, right? It's fed. The data is fed to it, and then it um, it it just combines whatever has been fed, and then of course it can also do a little bit beyond what has been fed by combining uh, like what Aisha was saying algorithms. Now, which means who has fed the the basic information for AI to think? Um, if we have more um, male developers and that's what we're going to get and this is again where we need women taking up all these roles where even in automotive industry if a car is designed by a woman and then you will see a compartment to put a baby bottle you'll see compartments to put our handbag so i think this is where we need more women even for me i can see i am the executive director of my organization imagine if it was a man sitting there that man is not going to be called for uh, to train women to speak in women uh, platform so i get all these engagements all the time speaking in women and um, platform speaking for women in stem and for international women's day so if my position 
is taken by a man. Now we're going to lose that one person, one uh, voice. So I think it's also, uh, that is why we want more uh, women to be in board, uh, uh, board rooms. So decisions are made by equally by women as well. So I think this as besides what Aisha said about policies and govern, um, uh, governance, uh, women participation in decision-making roles is very important. Thank you. I think it's been covered by uh, Ms. Maha and Ms. Aisha. So uh, we need more uh, and we need to create more inspiring uh, women uh, to break stereotype and pave uh, the way uh, for future generation of women. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for this really great conversation. Um, hopefully this is not the first time or last time that we'll see you. Um, hopefully part of the STEM NS network for sure. Um, we have just a few more uh, speakers, and um, I will turn it over to Shane. Thank you. Thank, Thank you to you all the all speakers. Good. Uh, it was right. very interesting, and I believe we can uh, continue the conversation in our next regional uh, seminar. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have that uh, with you on board. So next, uh, we will move on to the next agenda, that is... Uh, uh, may I now invite uh, the Regional Gender Advisor from Istanbul Regional Hub, uh, Cornelio, to introduce the RBAP and RBA, RBAP RBEC STEM for All platform. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Dr. Sul, uh, who is a hydrogen energy expert and has a doctorate in engineering degree from Tokyo uh, Tokai University in Japan, who is a current uh, STEMnist. Uh, member in the STEM for All platform and will be sharing some of our experiences with us. So over to you, Cornelio. Thank you very much, Shering. Um, and of course, it has been uh, amazingly to hear from the STEMists and to hear the experiences and all of these discussions. I almost don't want to interfere right now because I think we went into the substance I'm coming back uh, basically to where uh, also Gerd and Stelena were mentioning about the, the collaborative um, nature of the STEM for All platform. But I would like to say that the STEM for All is much more beyond the platform in itself. It, it is about the network of, of STEMists who make the platform work and who make the connections and who, who do all of these uh, mentorship, formal, informal, um, and the learning and the peer learning uh, among the among the seminaries. So I think to me, it's, it's going beyond the collaboration between UNDP, RBAP, and UNDP RBEC, the two different regions. It's really about collaboration between seminaries from the two regions. And that is the biggest, I would say, uh, the biggest joy that I personally have to know that all the way from Europe to the Pacific, Feminists are actually coming together with a voice because what we heard also and what I heard today is really that uh, the voice of leadership was, is what matters. It's not only being in STEM per se, but it's being in those leadership positions, making the breakthrough in different sectors from uh, uh, biotechnologies to spatial to communication. I think that was uh, one of the areas that I, I I was also listening very carefully, how do we make sure that we use the communication um, rightly so to advocate for this? Because when we talk about gender inequality, we talk about the power inequalities. And when we talk about the power, they usually say there is three different powers. There is the, the power that is given by authority, that is the power that you know a person has by itself. But there is one element of the power, which is the power of the discourse or the power of the narrative which is very much linked to the communication. So I really enjoyed listening to the, to the panelists uh, um, in the previous session. And I think these kind of discussions, I would love to see it more and more in the, in the community of practice of the feminists. Um, because one thing that will be, you know, one other thing that will be benefiting from this collaboration is the, is the joining of the communities of practices. Because the STEM for All platform and the STEMist network is engaging on a continuous basis. So now I'm happy to see that all the way from the Western Balkans to the Pacific countries, small island countries, uh, the community of practice will be coming together and discussing all of these issues. Um, in, in, in our region, uh, we've also started to look beyond 
just having women in STEM, uh, but promoting very, very consistently women's leadership through STEM in the different areas. And um, coming from the you know recent developments and the, the CSW, um, climate change, green transition, disaster risk management are really some of the areas where we are seeing you know, fewer women, and, you know, in, in, in leadership and fewer women that can shape up the agenda of these regional meetings, global meetings. So I think that's an area where we could also all together strive for as, you know, as feminists. I will stop here because, as I said, I think we need to continue hearing from the feminists rather than for ourselves. I would like to thank again, uh, Gert and Steliana for this, you know, uh, opening up the collaboration between the two uh, UDP regional hubs, but also thank you, thank you all of the STEMinists and all of the, uh, you know, women leaders, but also gender advocates from basically half of the world uh, for your dedicated work on a daily basis. The platform and the network is really to, to amplify the voices that you have and to amplify the messages that we're giving to the policy makers and to the decision makers. Um, so without further ado, I would like to also uh, give the floor to another uh, feminist from the network and her name is Dr. Sauli Zoldayakova from Kazakhstan. Um, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So at first, congratulations on the expansion of the STEM poll project. Uh, I think uh, the Asia Pacific region is also one of the region where women need credibility. Uh, I have a lot of friends from those countries whom I met during my study in Japan. And I know a superwoman from Indonesia who encouraged me to go to PhD. Uh, as I mentioned, I studied in Japan. Originally, I'm from Kazakhstan and I got my bachelor's, master's and doctoral degrees at Tokai University in Japan. I studied and researched about hydrogen energy system and hydrogen storage materials. After I came back to my home country and started to work on the establishment of the first hydrogen energy center in Central Asia. So um, this year I was selected uh, to the list of women in hydrogen. So 50 women leaders in hydrogen in the world by hydrogen economists. So it is a big honor to me and it is also good motivation to inspire to be motivated as a young uh, specialist. So for now I have a small team. Uh, I always say it is a small team, but with a big plans and uh, always try to keep in my mind about gender equality, even in my small team. Um, so to uh, expanding of the network, helping to promote our activity and STEM whole project platform, one of the methods to show my activity, uh, to meet other women colleagues, to be a mentor or mentee and uh, help to support each other and share our experience. And uh, I will be happy to connect with colleagues from Asia Pacific region who are in this field. And uh, I really hope for fruitful cooperation. Uh, two years ago, I had an interview for STEM whole pro uh, platform as a STEMinist, and that article uh, published it on the platform, and it was a good opportunity for me to show, to tell about myself, my research, my study in Japan, about difficulties of being a woman in STEM, about my current activities. So it was a good chance to increase my visibility. Uh, that's why um, I think STEM Hall give a unique chance for everyone to show, to promote our own activities. Uh, for example, according to the UNESCO Institute for Statistics uh, in Kazakhstan, 54% of researchers are women. However, the ratio of women in STEM is low and also ratio of women in decision makers level in top uh, in uh, leaders level are very low. So that's why uh, for me, it is important to inspire, to motivate a young specialist as a feminist. Currently I'm working uh, on implementing new direction as a hydrogen energy. I'm trying to be a pioneer and uh, 
uh, support young specialists and also want a bridge between science and industry. So uh, in, in the end, uh, I would like to share my favorite phrase. Uh, when you educate men, you educate men. When you educate women, you educate generations. That's why we have a very important, huge role to educate new generation. And I would like uh, to say good luck to all my colleagues. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Dr. Zul. This was so encouraging. I mean, uh, the your last, uh, you know, the ending was also very encouraging to show that uh, women can make a difference. Uh, and we hope that through today's uh, webinar, we've been able to inspire other women. Truly, this has been quite an eye-opener as well as an inspiring, uh, you know, panelist here who are real role models for all of us. Uh, with this, I think we'll conclude because we've run a little uh ahead of time uh, so um uh, we will encourage all uh, participants to join the stem for all platform but uh, as tiffany mentioned we have a form that can be filled in order to be part of the platform we will also be reaching out to all of you individually through emails as we have them with us now uh, and uh, we would like to thank every one of you for joining us today for the STEM study launch as well as the STEM for All platform. And we hope that uh, we will be able to reconnect and keep uh, the STEM for All platform vibrant as well as uh, active as much as possible. And we will keep you all, uh, uh, you know, uh, informed about our future activities. Uh, so thank you to everybody for joining today uh, and making this a success. Thank you so much. Thank you.